Hello, welcome to another video that I'm in. I just make so many videos, but this is another one. I'm actually really quite excited about this. I'm going to talk about in this video something called a higher order function. And I, um, I, as if you followed my tutorials and things over the years, I'm kind of like an old Java programmer. <laughs> Probably the language that I've programmed the most in is Java, and specifically processing. Uh, which is a development environment built on top of Java that I use. And so I really was taught and have learned and have practiced like object-oriented programming, object-oriented programming, object-oriented programming, object-oriented programming. <laughs> I love object-oriented programming. But there is this thing called functional programming, which is very popular uh, and interesting. And I'm, uh, I want to dip my toe a little bit. And JavaScript is a, a, a language where functions are the sort of primary building block of the language. And there's lots of things. And of course, you can do this, I know, in Java now with like Java 72, whatever version is now 100,051. Um, um, but I want to look at this idea of a higher order function and kind of, kind of wade into this idea of functional programming a bit more. Now, this video is appearing in my ES6 playlist, even though some of the stuff that I'm going to use is not ES6 specific. But I think it's useful to have it here because I'm going to use in these tutorials also this particular syntax known as the arrow syntax or the arrow function. And I'm going to use that. And that's only available in JavaScript ES6. And if you are confused about what the arrow function is, <laughs> magical tutorial about that in a separate video. And I think I talk about ES6 versus ES5, which are different versions of JavaScript there. OK, so what is, I'm going to attempt to define <laughs> what a higher order function is. And a high, I, what I, the way I like to think about it is like, well, there's a function. I could define a function like this. Function hello. And then I could write console log hello in there. And that's a function. It's a named block of code that I can execute by calling the name of the function. And there's lots of ways to declare functions in JavaScript and with ES6 syntax. And I could say var hello equals or let hello equals or const hello equals. So many possibilities. This is not a higher order function because it is just a function on its own, on the level playing field of functions. A higher order function is a function that kind of has two levels of functions to it, or more than two. In other words, what if this function expects as its argument another function? So you're calling this function and sending it a function. That's a higher order function. Or what if this function actually makes a function or returns one back to you somehow. That is also a higher order function. So any function that either takes a function as input or sends a function out as output, that is known as a higher order function. And you can do all sorts of kooky, interesting things that, can, that look kind of fancy, that can be fun, but also can make your code easy to write. Um, so I, the reason, one of the reasons why I'm doing this is there are a lot of higher order functions available for JavaScript arrays. And those are really useful. Let me name a few of them. Uh, map, sort, reduce, filter. So uh, in the subsequent videos that are following this one, I'm going to start going through these functions. And it's my goal to actually then tie these functions into a particle system example because I want to look at, well, you know, I can look at the, how these stuff works and just put numbers in it, but what might be an actual real life scenario in the sort of creative coding graphics world that I might use them in? So this is the whole landscape here. I'm going to start with just basic higher order functions. I'm going to write a couple like goofy, trivial examples. I'm going to stop. <laughs> I'm going to come back and start going through higher order array functions uh, and then try to like tie that into a particle system. That's my plan. I know that sounds fine. I think it's OK. All right, so let's try to look at this idea of uh, passing a function to a function or returning a function from a function. Uh, so let's, uh, I have a sort of empty bit of code here. I've got the P5 library loaded. I don't need it for what I'm going to demonstrate, but it has a nice setup function, which is like the window on load function. So I like to have that available to me. I don't actually need to do this in setup, but I'm going to anyway. All right, so let's say I were to define a function and I'm going to call it um, um, sing. And in the function, I'm going to say la, 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 la. And then when I'm done, OK, no, so let's just do that. <laughs> OK, this is my function sing. Oh, I got to make it, I got to make it in the global space so I can call it from the console. <laughs> the setup function is totally irrelevant at this point. I don't know why I talked about that. Um, so I have this function called sing. 
So now I'm gonna go over here and I'm gonna say sing. Song, song, ba ba sing. Ah! Oh, I reload the page. Sing. La 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 la. All right, now craziness. What if I were to define, what if I were to say, hey, this function takes as an argument another function, and that might be called like a callback. And when I finish singing, I execute that function. So you can see this might, this, this might be code that you've never written yourself, but it's code that's happening all the time in JavaScript libraries that you use. Because a lot of times you say, hey, load this JSON and here's a callback. Or do this, but apply it with this function. So this is the idea of if you could send in a function, right? The parentheses aren't here, right? Because this is actually the name of a variable, the name of the function. It's the parameter to sing is callback. And if that is a function, I can execute that function here. So in other words, I could say, now in setup, I could say, I could make my own function, um, sing, uh, what would be, so what's something besides singing, <laughs> which I could do, uh, meow. And I'm gonna say console.log meow, meow. And then I'm gonna say sing, meow. And actually, let's just, let's do this all in the, I'm gonna um, put this here, and then I'm in here, right? One thing, now what happens if I call sing, it says callback is not a function. So I didn't pass that parameter. So I have to now say sing uh, meow. And then I'm giving it the meow function, so sing la la la's, and then it executes that meow function. Now I could be sort of thoughtful about this and I could say like, oh, only call the callback if it exists. Uh, what did I get wrong here? Whoops. Um, so now I could do some error checking in my function. So I could do this, and it's okay for me to say sing, it just does la la la, or I could say sing, and then when you're done, execute meow. And if I wanted to be really, really, really careful about this, I think I could say as long as it's an instance of a function. Who knows if that's right? <laughs> um, so I could say sing meow, and then sing and it would still work. So um, this is this idea of being able to call a function from a function. Okay. I should also mention that I'm kind of writing this code in a very long-winded way where I'm naming all of my functions. And this is not what you would typically see as JavaScript programmers do. And eventually I'm gonna be like peeling this away and having anonymous functions and eventually getting to this arrow function again. So for example, just to make this case clear, probably another way that I might do this is say, oh, I wanna call sing and then I just want to add pass in another function to it. So you can see here, this is me calling the function sing and giving it an argument, which is all this code, which is a function definition with no name, an anonymous function. And this might look even more clear to you if I do this, right? You can sort of see like this is the whole argument being passed in between those other, my head's blocking, those other two parentheses. So that's a whole function definition just being passed right in. And, you know, spoiler alert, I could kind of write it like this with arrow, but we're going to get back to that later. We're gonna, I'm going to come back to the arrow function later. Okay, so one more thing let's try. So this is a function that you're passing a function. Another thing you could do is I could have a function return a function. Some might even call that like a function factory. Ooh. If you're a Java programmer or something, you love factories. Okay, um, so let's get rid of this. And I'm gonna use a pretty standard example. It's probably one that you would find in countless other tutorials. Um, and I'm gonna write a function called multiplier. I'm gonna show you why this is useful. And what this function, well, first of all, let me just call, write a function called multiplier and give it an argument called factor. Um, give it an argument called x and an argument called factor. And I'm gonna return x times factor. So this is a general function that's just gonna take two numbers and multiply them together. So if I load the page here, I'm gonna say multiplier x oh, five, two. And what should I get? <laughs> Nothing. Oh, I spelled it wrong. Multiplier <laughs> 10. If I say multiplier three comma nine, 27. I'm making a little calculator here. Okay. But what if I want to actually create different functions that multiply by different factors? So instead of, um, instead of having x here, what if I just said return a function that receives x and multiplies it by some factor? Look at this. The multiplier returns a new function 
that uses the factor that was passed in. Whoa. So in other words, what do I mean by this? I can now say, whoops, and I'm just using the console here, so let me give me more space here. I'm going to make this a little bigger. I can now say, let, let doubler equal multiplier 2. Whoa. What is doubler now? Right? I didn't get it. Is it a number? Did I multiply something? No. I created a function. I created a function that uses the number that returns x times 2. So if I were to say let tripler equal multiplier 3, now I've created a function, right? We can actually just double check. Let me just say what, what doubler is. Look, this is what doubler is. Now, it's still showing me factor here, but really inside that function, it's holding on to that number 2 that was passed in. So in other words, if I were to say doubler 4, what am I going to get? <laughs> no, I messed something up. What did I do wrong? Oh, it doesn't say, oh, this has to say, ah, oh, oh, I have a mistake. Look at this. I wasn't paying attention to what I was doing. This is a fine mistake for me to have. Right? It didn't return anything. Undefined. I forgot to also have the return here. So this is kind of weird looking, but this multiplier function makes a function that returns x times factor. So now if I start over here and I say let doubler be a multiplier, create a function with a factor of 2, and let tripler be a create a function with a factor of 3, now I can say uh, doubler 4 and I get 8, or I can say tripler 4 and I get 12. Okay, so this is this idea of higher order functions. Oh, all right, actually two things that I forgot. Number one is um, this can also be, this is also an example of a closure meaning that when you create this function by passing in factor, this like kind of closure bubble lives on and the value of factor is retained, even though it's sort of technically a local variable just to this function multiplier. So this is a, I have another video all about JavaScript closures, and this is an example of that as well. And then I forgot. This is a case where I can use the arrow function to make this look you know, nice and clean and simple. Uh, and you know, I'm very torn about this because on the one hand, the arrow function can make code look very cryptic and confusing. On the other hand, it can really simplify things. So let's, let's talk about that for a second. So um, uh, what, what does the arrow function do? So um, this is actually, if I just rewrite this function down here, this is what I've written. So the arrow function, you can watch my arrow function tutorial, allows me to, first of all, instead of saying the word function, I can delete the word function and I can put the arrow here. So this is a function definition with one argument x and this is the code that the function executes. Now interestingly enough, if there's only one argument x, I don't need the parentheses. So if there were two, if this were a function that's like multiplying two things, I have to keep those parentheses. But if there's only one, I don't need them. So now I've simplified it like this. It also so happens that if there's only one line of code in that function, you don't need the curly brackets. The curly brackets can be assumed, and I can now write it like this. And guess what? If there's only one line of code, the return is assumed. So I can actually get rid of this return. So actually, this is a completely identical way to write the function up here. So what this can actually be now is this. Uh, so this is what I mean. This, you might look at this and be like, what in the world is it doing? But after you use, and I can speak from experience because arrow functions were brand new to me like less than a year ago. <laughs> but after you use them more and more, it starts to seep into your brain a little bit, like whether you're doing some mental gymnastics to translate it back or it's just kind of intuitive. But there is a nice quality to saying like almost like x transforms into x times factor. And it's, it's confusing because that return is returning a function. But that function is returning x times factor. So let's take a look. Hopefully I got this right. Let's take a look at this. And I'm going to uh, refresh here. And I'm going to, uh, did I save? I'm going to save, refresh. And, and, and what I'm actually going to do is let's just put this in the code. Let's just say uh, let multiplier equal, um, oh, sorry, let doubler equal, um, and, and let's get rid of this. should not be here. Let doubler equal, um, and I, can, I don't need the setup function. I'm being so silly. Let doubler equal a multiplier to, 
let tripler equal multiplier 3. Oh, and I got to have the i there. Okay, so I made those two multiplier functions. Refresh. When I hit doubler 4, I get 8. And tripler 4, I get 12. So, wonderful. Look at that lovely use of the arrow functions and higher order functions. So, we're do I'm done now with this video. What I've really just discovered here basically is that a higher order function is a function that either receives a function as a callback, and if you're writing a JavaScript library and you're asking people to call functions that happen asynchronously, this might be something you provide as an option. Oh, if you send me a function, I'm the library, I will execute that function for you to let you know when I'm done. So that's a very useful technique that you'll see in P5 and all sorts of JavaScript libraries. So receiving a function as input or returning a new function, just like I demonstrated with that multiplier function. So that's the basic idea. Now, I am not going to write my own higher order functions right in the next videos. I'm just gonna make use of some useful ones that happen to live in the JavaScript array uh, object. So I don't know which one I'll start with. <laughs> Tune in to the next video to find out. Ooh, suspense. And I'll see you then. Thanks for watching.